now that we we are in a little bit of a time crunch, so I am actually going to be very brief with my introductions. I would like to give the speakers their due, so I will not shorten their talks, but we're going to shorten the Q&A a little bit, and instead of it being 25 minutes, we'll make it 20, but let's see if we can stay um, within the, al the allotted time. So I'm going to move quickly. Marianne, did you come back? Yes. Okay. Um, to introduce our next speaker, both formally and just a, a bit of informality. Caroline Constant is Professor Emerita of Architecture at the University of Michigan and a visiting scholar at both the Graduate School of Design at Harvard and the School of Architecture and Planning at MIT. Her name has already been used several times in people who have alluded to articles that she wrote on Eileen Gray, non-heroic modernism, and her book on Eileen Gray and architecture obviously was a landmark one. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, she is now working on a very important project, which she refuses to give me a publication date for. That's very Caroline. Um, it is on Cambridge School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture for Women, which, as she described, is the place that women went when they couldn't go to Harvard, which is a super interesting project. I would like to share the fact that, as Chloe knows, at a certain interval in this project, when we agreed that we would wanted to elaborate on the architecture aspect of Eileen Gray's work, we contacted her very late in the game, asking if she would allow us to reproduce um, the entries that she did in the back of her architecture book. And we contacted Fiden, actually, thanks to Irma. And what happened after that was actually something which I didn't expect, which was not simply a straight on reproduction, but a modification an expansion, an elaboration. Um, and we have in the book, I think 96, what we call case studies on both objects and architecture of which she um, is a major contributor. So I wanna thank her for that and for the kind of night and day activity that went on to make that happen. So I am very pleased to introduce Caroline who brings us into the architecture part um, of our symposium in a talk called Eileen Gray, Unfinished Stories. Um, I have to say, so this is a very personal talk. It's not an academic talk. It's not, it's not new research, it's old research and methodologies. Um, and I first wanna thank Nina and Chloe. Um, it's been a sleepless three months, but <laughs> but I, I was always very hesitant to go back to old work and rethink it. But Nina pushed me so much in new directions that it was definitely worthwhile. I'm always happy when I'm learning new things. Um, so my story with Eileen Gray, my personal story with Eileen Gray, starts with um, the exhibition that was held at Princeton in 1973, organized by Sheila de Bretville who opened that same year, the Woman's Building in Los Angeles. And I remember seeing a letter from Sheila de Bretville to Michael Graves, who organized the exhibition, and it was on her pink gridded stationery, square, of course. Um, and, um, and it took me, and I, I was just totally entranced by this very small exhibition of Eileen Gray's work. It was a part of the larger exhibition that was um, held in Los Angeles. And it went around to 10 different schools. It went to Columbia, I believe, as well as, as Princeton. And it took me, I would say 20, I, I was just entranced. And it took me 20 years to figure out how to talk about Eileen Gray because it was such a kind of direct um, response. So even though Eileen Gray didn't believe in feminism, and in fact, I have problems about excluding men from the conversation. I always did. Um, but it was a course uh, at Harvard, but taught by my Harvard colleague, Homa Forjati, on feminism and architecture, which they didn't actually talk about architecture, they just talked about feminist theory, that really um, gave me the a kind of vehicle to figure out how to talk about Eileen Gray. Now, I'm not going to go into that because it's a very indirect question. Um, but um, Oops, there. 
But Eileen Gray, I mean, Michael Graves, who organized this exhibition, had a copy of L'Architecture Vivant. And interestingly enough, it was Peter Eisenman's copy. And Peter, Peter Eisenman wasn't interested in Eileen Gray, which I think makes total sense. <laughs> I like Peter Eisenman too, but anyway. Um, and uh, it took me at least 20 years to buy my own copy. Every rare book dealer in Paris knew that I was looking for this, for this book. And when I finally bought it, as I was walking out of the shop, the, the shopkeeper was on the phone saying, calling the others and saying, she's found it. So you don't have, to, you can stop looking. <laughs> um, and so it was really, as has been mentioned before, Joseph Rickwert, who was one of my professors at Princeton, but I don't remember him talking about Eileen Gray at the time, um, who brought her back with the, the, um, the, the publication initially in Domus in 1968. Um, and as you've heard the, the kind of story, I'll tell you another story about Joseph Rickwert and Eileen Gray in a moment. Um, but that was followed by, uh, at, so, so this is all before I started really doing my work. Um, there was a 1980 exhibition at, at the v &A and MoMA jointly that was mostly about the furniture and the rugs. And there were photographs of the architecture. And then there was Stuart Johnson's book, which you see on the right, which was published both in Britain and in America, 1984, as a kind of catalog to that exhibition. And Bridget Loy's dissertation, very important, I think the first really um, scholarly investigation of Gray's work, um, and of 1984, and then there was Peter Adams' biography. And as we all know, you can't really trust Peter Adam, but... Um, <laughs> Well, because he's not a scholar, it's okay. Just I mean, every single every single item in his bibliography is wrong. It took me, you know, it took me ten years to straighten it out. So, so um, I remember sending my bibliography to Jennifer, saying my publisher won't publish it. So if you'd like it, here it is. Uh, so, um, so that was kind of what there was. Uh, when I started my, um, in fact, so we say infatuation, this is kind of half of what uh, is on the website for Amazon.com right now. I'm going to go quickly over that. Um, so then I started uh, working in the various archives. I'm not going to go through them all, but the VNA, and they'll, you know, you didn't have a phone, you didn't have scanners, you didn't have, you had slides. And so my a uh, collection of uh, Eileen Gray material is still in the form of slides. It's almost impossible because who has a slide viewer anymore? Um, and uh, and when you went to the VNA at that time, I haven't been back recently, but um, there was no organization. You could see three drawings at a time. They weren't organized by project. It was hell. And so um, basically, I just had to take slides of everything and try to figure out how one drawing might relate to another or what the projects were or how might one might guess at a possible date for them. This is uh, the architecture that I was really pursuing mostly. Then Mary McLeod suggested I look at um, the decorative arts for maybe a month. So that was another six months of my life. <laughs> And um, but it was really it was really interesting. Um, so uh, I also had a lot of trouble, even though kind of women architects were becoming sort of the thing. Uh, I had hard hard time getting funding for my research. So, for example, the University of Florida, where I was then teaching, said re rejected my application for funding for three thousand dollars because it was clear that I just wanted to um, have a vacation in the south of France. I have to. I have to tell you, that's the last place I want a vacation. Um, <laughs> but it was an important place to go to do research on Eileen Gray. There was a lot of serendipity to the whole thing. People have told me I should write a whole book on finding Eileen Gray. But there was a moment I remember when I walked into a bookstore in uh, Boston, I think, and, and w walked right to the poetry section and opened and w a book on Baudelaire, and I opened it to his poem in Vitation Voyage. And that, and you know, that's kind of how I made the connection. 
Um, and I don't know why. I don't usually walk into bookstores and go to the poetry section and open books by Baudelaire. But anyway, um, there was a lot of that sort of thing happening in terms of my research. Then there was jumping the fence at E1027. You know, Michael Lieberman wasn't involved yet. And, um, and so uh, the first time I jumped the fence, I'm terrified of breaking the law and being caught, particularly... <laughs> In France, the first time I jumped the fence, it wasn't. It was before this, um, so it wasn't such a wreck. But um, but the second time I jumped the fence, it was right after uh, the, these vandal, right after the Peter Kagi had been murdered by his gardener on the site, um, which Prunella Clough and I cheered at when we found out um, <laughs> at a dinner party. I know, <laughs> um, and. Uh, and um, so this is what I saw. I got this image offline because my pictures are all slides, you know. Um, and um, uh, yeah. And what was interesting, actually, about the, these these people who'd been living there, um, and they were raided by the police, and so their food was like still sitting in, you know, bowls of pasta lying around, still bit, almost warm. I mean, that's how that's how much recently they had. Um, been kicked out, but they hadn't, they broke everything they could, but they hadn't touched the murals, which I thought was really interesting that in a way, Le Corbusier, for all the, I'm not going to go into that story because it's too complicated, but um, for all the debate about Le Corbusier and Eileen Gray, he really did help save the building. Um, so then uh, the next thing was to try to get into Tempeiapaya. I had several uh, appointments to get into Tempeiapaya and the horrible woman who was the caretaker living there would always, you know, greet me at the door and say, je suis désolé, but, you know, so, somebody died or I have a toothache or there was always something. So I've never, I've never actually gotten in. Um, and, uh, and so I've just heard uh, that Madame Ferrari is dead now, which I'm happy to hear. <laughs> But the fate of that house is unknown. So Michael Liekerman, if you could please take it on, I would be really, really happy. Um, I actually think it's probably her most important building. Um, and then there's the issue of finding Lou Peru. Now, now Eileen Gray always said that to her family and friends, at least Prunella told me this, that Lou Peru wasn't important. To me, that makes it more important. And I think it's really a remarkable indication of the way that, um, let's say, vernacular ideas and a kind of more simplified way of living uh, began to kind of take over her life. Of course, she was quite old. I don't think she was lazy, ever lazy. So, um, and that's the, so my obsession with Eileen Gray led me to have students make models of her buildings. Finding Luke Grew was something else. I kept driving around in the vicinity, couldn't find it, couldn't find it. I finally went to the concierge in my hotel because I only had, a, it was central pay in the summer. I only had a room for one night. It was the most expensive room I've ever had in my life. And um, and the concierge said, oh, you should call Monsieur Ledoux. He was the, the town architect at the time. So I called Monsieur Ledoux who had had a stroke. So communicating in French was not easy, but we made an appointment to visit the next day. I went to his house. He lived across the street from Eileen Gray. He didn't know who she was. I mean, he knew she was Madame Gray, but he didn't know she was the famous architect, Eileen Gray. But when she died and her house was sold, he was the architect for the renovation of the next owner. And he, no, no, he didn't do a bad job. <laughs> It's the next person who ruined it recently. <laughs> but uh, but so her garden was still there. The garage was still there. Anyway, um, he also took, he in his garden, he had the, the screen that goes across the, the door um, in, in the, the garden door that you can see in that model. So he knew that there was something going on there. He made drawings. The only, I never saw the drawings like this, they didn't, because Peter Adam wouldn't show me anything. So, um, so uh, well, he showed me a little bit, but not much. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, the only drawings I could base my model on, or my students model on, were um, drawings that he had made uh, before he started his own renovation. Um, 
Okay. Then there's, oh yeah. So these are, so Prunella loaned me a whole lot of photographs, more than that are in the exhibition. Um, but her garden, that view on the right, it still looked exactly like that. Now there's a lap pool in it. Not my fault. Um, so Prunella Clough, say you've seen this, Lord Stone's photograph. I love Prunella Clough. Um, so she she was really um, so helpful to my work, but I never, I always wanted to talk about her because I love her work. I love her paintings. I bought one of her paintings, but she, we would have dinner in her in her kitchen and she would never let me into the studio next door. Like she was a totally private person, but um, but totally uh, kind of open to people who wanted to to visit with her. And so through her, I got access to the portfolios to, and Peter Adam had one copy um, and she had another, and I basically could kind of borrow them, borrow photographs, whatever. And then back to Joseph Rickwert. So um, Rickwert told me that Gray didn't like to talk about herself. He was always, she was always interested in talking about others, like, what are you doing? What's going on in your life? And that was exactly the way Prunella was. She wouldn't talk about herself. Um, and, uh, but one thing, he told me this wonderful anecdote about the Maison de Verre, which you probably know by Pierre Chirot. Well, not Pierre, not by Pierre Chirot. So, so um, he asked, he was having dinner with Eileen Gray in Paris, and he asked, whether um, she knew of the house by Pierre Chirot in her neighborhood. And she said, there's a house by Pierre Chirot in my neighborhood? And he explained that it was the Maison de Verre. And he said, oh, you, Eileen Gray said, oh, you mean the, the house by Byford, the Dutch architect? And um, so recently, you know, of course, the people who owned it for so long just wanted to elevate Pierre Chirot's name. And so that's primarily how it was associated for a long time. But the other day I looked on Wikipedia and look what it says, architect <laughs> Bernard Byford with Pierre Chirot. And of course, Louis Dalbe was also the, the metal worker was also a very important part of the, um, of the uh, whole enterprise. So then I, I got, a, I was obsessed. I had my students, this is not in chronological order, by the way, but my, I had, so my students built models of um, a lot of the projects. And uh, there was a big exhibition at the Frankfurt Museum in uh, the Deutsche Architecture Museum in Frankfurt in 1996. That's when, uh, that's when the guy, Kagi, the guy who was living in E1027 was murdered and Prunella and I went hooray at dinner. Um, and uh, we had, so with my Harvard colleagues, Wilfred Wang and Kevin Kieran, the late Kevin Kieran, um, we organized uh, exhibitions at Harvard, the University of Florida, and then this one in, and, and did this catalog um, for the exhibition in Frankfurt. And I remember once flying into London to kind of start to work on Eileen Gray. In fact, the first time I went to London to work on Eileen Gray, the second day the BBC interviewed me. That's how little, like already I was an expert and I hadn't started doing any research. That's, that's how much things have changed over time. Um, and I remember uh, get, uh, sort of arriving at, at uh, this apartment where I was staying and there was some of my favorite things. Um, and so, you know, jet lagged as I was, I just stayed awake all day um, uh, living with these things. And, and Prunella did admit that this was um, both Eileen Gray and Prunella. It was exhibited in the Frankfurt exhibition. Um, so then uh, before, right before my book came out, Prunella died, like literally months before my book came out. And, um, but I had told her that I was divorcing Eileen Gray. It had been 12 years of intense experience um, with the help of actually many people in this room. Um, and, uh, and, but the divorce was never final. So my book came out, <laughs> my book came out in um, 2000. Um, and I really thought of it as a, kind of a beginning more as a way to kind of hopefully inspire uh, new research. It's amazing to me that 20 years later, we've, 
we really do have some significant new research with this exhibition. And I'm just, I've never worked on a publication where, um, where the person in charge, this was Nina in this case, said, more text, more images, <laughs> because publishers always say less text, less images. Um, so it was really, it was a total delight, um, a, a sleepless delight, but, but a delight nonetheless. And then in 2013, uh, sorry, in 2012, I was made an honorary member of the Royal Institute of the Architects of Ireland, which was so amazing. Eileen Gray had that honor and I was just kind of overwhelmed. Um, with uh, that, that was the ceremony which happened in New York. Um, and then in 2013, the next year, Jennifer had her first symposium at the National Museum of Ireland, which she couldn't attend because she was in the hospital. Um, and that's when I met Renaud Barres, who's, I realized, knew far more about E1027 than I ever would. And that continues to be the, tr the, uh, the, the, uh, the case today, as you will hear shortly. Um, in 2015 and 16, I know I know what people think of these movies. I do too, but um, but I have to say that when um, when I got the kind of Kickstarter campaign for for the the film um, The Price of Desire, and it said something horrible about Eileen Gray and the Privacy, something ridiculous. I immediately wrote a very rude email. Um, to Mary McGuckian, who was the kind of force behind these two films, and she responded immediately, wonderful to hear from you. <laughs> so, um, and I adore Mary McGuckian, I have to say, and I went to the opening in Dublin, and there I am with Orla Brady, who played Eileen Gray in the film. <laughs> um, the Gray Matters is another thing, Jennifer and I, and it's, I think, I, I think they're such terrible films, I can't, I can't go anywhere with them, but I, I do love Mary McGuckian. Then, um, then I got called back a little bit, not in a not in a kind of major way, by Michael Liekerman, who's here today, um, who is the genius behind the restoration of E1027, which is going to be completed soon. And um, and I, I've I have been able to see the villa in its semi-restored state, but before that, it was only from jumping the fence. Um, and, and during a kind of celebration that happened in 2017, we got to have, uh, there's Jennifer Goff and Joseph Rickward. Um, a lot of kind of people from that, you know, that I'd encountered over my life were kind of brought together. Chloe was there. Um, we all had dinner. We had like so, so many meals there. I can't, uh, believe it. And then, um, the next day we had lunch at Lake Trois de Mer with, Magna Revitato, and here she is um, in the second row here. Um, and, uh, and then here's Chloe <laughs> showing Prince Albert of Monaco, the exhibition that, he that she had organized with Renaud Barres and Tim Benton. Um, so then we get to, uh, you know, a, co a contact last fall uh, inviting me to reconcile, <laughs> a real reconciliation with Eileen Gray. And the first thing that I said to Nina, but it was I divorced her years ago. And um, anyway, I'm, I, I'm very happy actually to have been involved in all of this. I think the catalog is really amazing and I hope you all will enjoy it. Um, but I think, and I think Chloe stressed this too, just as I initially thought about my book that it was hopefully a prompt for further research. I, I hope this will be a prompt for further, further research as well, because one thing about Eileen Gray is um, we'll never know. We'll never know for certain, but I think there's a difference between a scholarly attitude towards establishing, um, let's say, the veracity of our uh, ideas about her work and, uh, and just kind of personal speculation. And I just want to show you how much time do I have? Am I okay? It's now? Oh, two minutes. All right. So Chloe, well, I want, it doesn't matter. Chloe, Chloe found this image uh, that says uh, Chambre EG. And it's not clear whether this meant she had a room at E1027, which room it was. Maybe Chloe disagrees, but that's okay. 
Um, we, we have our disagreements. That I think that's healthy too. But um, but I think it could be just Eileen Gray speculating about uh, about a room, about the role of a room. With and it's a principle. One was obliged to put in a small room all the implements necessary for life, just as we had to imbue a large room for the night, which I think is the salon, the living room at E ten twenty seven, since she doesn't call it a bedroom, with the impression of complexity. Um, and I think and then uh, there's sort of the question of the uh, the Eileen Gray draw the Le Corbusier drawings at um, in that Jennifer Goff brought to this uh, catalog um, with uh, and Nina's wonderful photograph that she took with her cell phone. Um, uh, so there's a lot of questions about the Jean Badovici, what was his role? There's about Le Corbusier. We'll never know for certain. Um, and uh, and of course Renaud Barre is. Uh, finding the these mo photographs of the model for the the house in Dakar of 1944, on which we know that Gray worked with Badovici. Um, I've always admired Tim Benton because he um, wants to kind of establish the truth of things, so he raises a lot of interesting questions. Unfortunately, we will never know the absolute truth. There really are no no. Uh, no absolute truths, but I think there's a lot that we could um, think about in terms of the relationship with Badovici, his drawing style, for example. I think he did this um, this combination of plan, section, and elevation of Jean Desert and of his own house in Vézelay, on which we know that Gray also worked and did drawings. So that although much can um, I think I have more drawings that, anyway, I love the way she drew. Um, the, the kinds of, of uh, dr drawings that she invented to um, explain her ideas. So though we'll never know for certain, um, much about his, her remarkable career can never be pro proven, but speculation can be substantiated through scholarship. Thank you. Thank you.